Hi guys, um, I hope you had a, a good chat during the break uh, with the other version of me or myself. Uh, thanks for your patience for the ones who survived the first part. Um, let's start talking about the CRL itself. Uh, the mo I think is the most exciting part of the, the tutorial. Um, the, uh, the idea is like uh, CRL new challenges and learning opportunities. Uh, the idea will try to list uh, some of the representative tasks uh, that I envision for CRL, which I feel are kind of quite general uh, new learning opportunities. Also, um, each, each one of these tasks has a new component that is present, I believe is present in the real world and hasn't been studied before. And I think this makes them appealing. Um, we use the language of causal inference, of causality, and the PCH, the CHT, uh, and the, the in other words, the model of the environment M as CMM and the graph G uh, to try to start understanding and then solving this task. There are six, six tasks or uh, six dimensions. The first three, I'll try to spend my the strategy here or the organization, the outline is like, I spend around 15 to 20 minutes in each of these three um, to give the idea of the task and some idea of the solution, of possible solutions. And then I will kind of make a brief summary, one minute, uh, or two minutes of the other three tasks, uh, given that there is no time of talking about all of them. Um, the task one uh, is uh, what we call generalized policy learning. Uh, so far, we assumed that the world was kind of cookie uh, cookie cutter in the sense that they, they exactly match these uh, two modalities, the online learning and the offline meaning three. The offline that is the the of policy and the do calculus or causal calculus kind of learning that can be the soft do, um, and and mo modes of learning. Then we'll see in maybe two or three minutes that the first example where things don't work very well, they get more involved, uh, and these methods alone cannot solve the problem. Then this is what we are calling uh, uh, GPL or generalized policy learning. Then I'll move to the second task that is when, when and where to intervene. Um, we also assume throughout, throughout the literature that uh, interventions are always good. Uh, if you can't change something, I should just do it. I should just change, I should just go to the system and make the interventions. Uh, here we will consider whether the best thing to do may be just to allow the system uh, to evolve naturally without uh, touching it. Perhaps sometimes when you touch or kind of mess up with things, we like to understand uh, these conditions. Uh, on the other hand, if the interventions are necessary, uh, we'll consider where to intervene in the system. Where is the exact, can you be surgical and just change what we need? Uh, here has this idea of refining the policy space that I would like to discuss. Everyone talks about policy. I would like to talk about the policy space and a little bit more about how I feel it or what do we feel about it, I should say. Um, task three out throughout the literature, uh, it's assumed that the agent has some type of automata-like behavior uh, and do, do not do introspection, do not do, not do counterfactuals. Here we cons consider endowing the agent uh, with uh, capability of doing counterfactual reasoning in a relatively general way, layer three, uh, which will lead to a different type of optimization function um, that is uh, conceptually different, but uh, we'll try to make as close as possible to the task that we understand that is in layer one, layer two. Then the, the problems that I'll talk less about, uh, the first one is called generalizability and robustness um, across environments. Um, I just mentioned this problem that I worked for many years called the transportability. Um, the, and the idea, the idea here is like, suppose that we allow a robot or a system to interact in a particular environment, uh, perform expar experiments and so on. Like in the California desert that we have a rover that is able, that is able to dig rocks and understand how to operate there. And now we send the rover to other place, to other environment uh, like Mars and you would like the, 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 the agent to operate uh, efficiently, avoid, avoiding to do too much uh, experimentation, given if it breaks, uh, things are pretty, whatever, it's pretty bad, given that it's far from here. And the question is like, what are the anchors that allows one to extrapolate across these different settings or across these different environments? Uh, they, are, they are for sure causal. As you know, there are these structural invariances that you discuss about the modularity, and you would like to understand this a little bit more um, in the problem of transportability. Main topic of my PhD thesis that here it's present in, uh, in, in uh, reinforcement learning in a, in a uh, substantive way. Um, then the, the task number five is learning causal models by combining 
observations and experiments, L1 or L2 data. Uh, so far, we assume that we're operating over a specific model of the environment. Uh, can be these kind of templates, as I mentioned, can be a multi arm bandits or MDPs or POMDPs, or it can be crafted by hand, the instrumental variable, the front door, or so on. In reality, uh, we would like to operate somewhat in between and uh, and don't commit so much the, the structure. We would like to be flexible. And especially in reinforcement learning, that the agent already have the capability to do interventions, then it should, it should try to leverage that and combine the observations and interventions in order to build its own uh, causal model. Um, I think it's very natural if you're considered to uh, grow a baby Einstein, there's a baby AI, and the baby AI should be evolve evolving its causal model or equivalence class of causal models. Uh, there are some subtleties there, but there are some kind of very exciting new results here. A huge literature that's as, as in, in structural learning that was just learning about the uh, how to uh, learn from call observations. Um, this recent piece of work is saying, oh, world is much bigger. And whenever in RL, we are already doing the interventions, then let's try to leverage that. We already have layer two capabilities. Third task. Uh, is about uh, causal imitation learning. Um, babies learn, babies are as, as well learned by mimicking other humans or other babies. So this is kind of well known and this motivation to imitation learning literature. Um, I think the nice observation here in the, in the causal uh, arena that the learner and the demonstrator can be different, can have different causal models. Uh, and it turns out that imitation is not necessarily what we want, or, or at least there are limits about when you should just be imitating other agent, and even, even when the other agent is an expert. Then the question here, we'd like to try to understand under what conditions imitation is, is safe, and uh, given that you don't observe the UR, the Y variable of the expert. I think it's quite unique. There are some kind of quite unique insights from the causal uh, uh, folks, from the causal side, and the task is quite cool. But now, the, let's, get, let's get into it. Let's start. Um, Talking about the tasks, I would like to talk about this generalized policy learning. This is work with my PhD study, Justin Jang. Um, online learning is usually undesirable due to financial, technical, or ethical constraints, as we already discussed. In general, one wants to leverage data collected under different conditions to speed up learning without, without having uh, to learn from scratch. On the other hand, the conditions required by offline learning are not always satisfied in many practical real world settings. In this task, we want to move, or we move, well, let me be positive here. Um, we move towards realistic learning scenarios where these modalities come together, uh, online and offline, uh, including when the most traditionally, traditional and provably necessary assumptions do not hold. That's important, this and necessary, and provably necessary. Let me try to, let's start with an example. Um, suppose consider this setting that we are trying to learn the input. We have an input distribution that is P of X and Y. X is the action, Y is the outcome or decision, Y is the outcome or the reward. Uh, and we would like to learn uh, a P of Y given to X. P of prime, Y given to X. Um, this could be in robotics that we are trying to learn by demonstration when the teacher can observe a richer context than the student. Uh, for example, has more accurate uh, sensors. Maybe an expert, uh, a, ba a baby robot is trying to learn with the older robot, and the older may be having infrared, but the baby didn't develop this skill yet. Or in the context of the medical uh, optimal experimental design from observational data. Uh, this, let's take with the example, given that uh, we already used some medical example here. Um, in the, in, the, in the the as input that is coming from this data set p of x and y you have x that is the decision y is the outcome and you have this exogenous set of u unobserved variables that is both affecting the x and is also affecting the y this is coming from physician of a collection of physicians that is coming from the for example columbia hospital you have i don't know one million data points there the small number by the way you have much more you have one million data points p of x and y now the task is try to learn what is the cause or effect of the drug in the outcome. And for example, the FDA or anyone that wants to understand causality seriously will say, oh, what I want is the P of Y do X or P of prime Y do X. I will, stay, I will stick the pi just implicitly. That is the one that is picking the value of X. We'll actually want to learn the P of Y given to X. 
and in some way would like to, which means that is the graph that there is a pi here pointing to x. This is the, the p of y given to x. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's the task. That's the task. Um, now, what we we just spent one hour here. Hopefully, it was okay for you guys or not not uh, not uh, suffer a lot of suffering. But I try to categorize, and then one of the modalities that I claim to be to have in the literature is the off policy learning is one of the two offline methods that we have. Um, the off policy learning, um, if you try to apply in this set, you have a violation of the A2 assumption. If you don't recall, you go back. But A2 means here that uh, A1 is OK. A1 means that we are controlling the same variable. Here we are trying to get the effect of x. x is the action. And here, or, or you have x as the action. That is what the physicians decide. And here we are trying to control x, the effect of x as well. Then A1 check. But A2 is the, the assumption that they are observing the world in the same way. They have the same context C. That while the, here, it's, it, it is not the case. This doesn't hold. The physician can observe a richer context. Maybe the physician didn't take note in the EHR, the health record. Or maybe can be in the subconscious level as well. I'll not get too much into that, maybe in task three. But maybe the physician is just affected by the way that the person is looking. Or what the prior beliefs that they have about this type of people that affects X and Y, whatever type is that. Then it's very common. The FDA comes in or any serious policy maker or decision maker will say, man, there is confounding data, there is confounding bias in this data. I cannot use it. I will need to conduct an exper experiment. Then, whatever, this is the off, this is the justification, a formal justification for that in terms of the off policy here. If you try to do the second off policy offline method, that is the do calculus, believe me, at least for now, you can, we can check later, but also do calculus or the soft do calculus, sigma calculus by Juan. Correa, you say not possible to do the inference in this case. Then it seems to be justify this feeling that we need to go online. What else? Now, my suggestion here, given that we have these 1 million data points uh, and online is a small number here of experiments that we do, maybe with 300 people and we spend, I don't know, maybe 5 million bucks. Um, I would suggest the following. Let's ignore that the physician and the FDA, quote unquote physician, quote unquote FDA, these two agents. Let's ignore their differences and let's pretend that the physician and the FDA are exchangeable. Um, can be technical, but at least for now here, let's use informally. That means that they are the same, qualitatively the same causally. And let's call this the naive TS, not a leading <laughs> title, but uh, a name, but uh, naive TS. Now, in other words, the naive TS will attempt to use the observational data as a prior. You get this P of Y given X here, and we'll try to see it or to use that as a prior in some way to a location procedure. You do that. By the way, I should mention, I'm using TS Thompson sampling. You can pick whatever method you want. My goal is just to get the simplest possible setting that I can disentangle the issue that I want to talk about. You can put UCB, you can put with MDPs, whatever method they are, and so on. Any method that is doing a location, that's fine. This will happen as well. What's the smallest one? I will get the S, that is the easy one uh, to talk at least here. And this flavor of the prior comes up naturally. And the, I will get binary variables. That is the most constrained setting. If you have any type of discrete or any type of continuous, there's so many degrees of freedom. You see in maybe four or five slides that will be even more likely that this problem is happening or, or obvious that it will be happening, I should say, because here it will happen all the time as well. Um, OK. Now, but the plot doesn't look very good. For sure, you should show more. Perhaps there is some kind of nice behavior there. But so far, picture is not good. This is the number of trials. This is the cumulative regret. Note here that the Oracle who is validating that is the environment SCM that I show in one second. Um, now, OK, but at least we have some kind of indication, that uh, indication, some kind of gut picture is not going, it's looking too like a straight. It's like uh, a flat um, or, or, or uh, kind of linear. Um, the, let's call this traditional TS, means ignoring the observational data. That's what's, this is what will happen when you throw away all this data and this behavior that is kind of the expected one uh, whenever you teach, uh, I don't know, uh, basic AI or undergrad AI, this is what we got, textbook kind of setting. 
Now, the, the obvious questions here, what you should be asking or what I'm asking when I, I, I first found that is like, how could this be happening? I, it seems to go against all oh, I understand when I put my, my statistical hat here, my statistician hat or machine learning hat. Um, it's like, man, the, one of the basic axioms here is like more data is always good. Now, apparently, the, the data is hurting. If I had there, I would be pulling the hair here. Um, the, the, but I with my hat. Um, the, then there's this kind of uncomfortable situation, apparently. To, in order, I would like to try to open up this plot here uh, to get a better idea what's maybe going on uh, inside the solver. Um, the plot on the top, uh, you have the red, uh, the naive, and on the bottom, we have the traditional. And let's try to parse it slowly here. Um, you, the, the truth here that is unknown by the agent, that this is what the agent is trying to learn, is like the, the dux0, that is the solid hot line here, is greater than the dux1, that is the dashed line. Why given dux0 is, is greater than dux1? Do, do this is don't know. Now, in this data that is coming from the hospital, uh, why given x1 is greater than x0? Then note here that as the prior that you have, oh, by the way, I'm plotting here number of rounds and the posterior here inside 95 CI, uh, confidence interval 95%. Um, note here that the, line, the, the, line is, uh, the, the lines are uh, switched, flipped. Uh, the dash here is the one that is the dux1 that is on top of the dux0. And based on what's going on here, it seems that there's a lot of weight and it's not pulling anything else. Then it's kind of stuck there in some way. While the traditional one that is throwing away the data, uh, is, is, it starts in 50-50. And then after, I don't know, a little bit less than 500, uh, we are already able to, with high confidence, disentangle these two guys here. The dux0 is better than the dux1. Then after this, uh, this time that we spend doing exploration, we already can just exploit and everything is fine. For sure, the bar here, just a note, the, this, this shade here, the, the uncertainty is much higher in the, the suboptimal arms as expected, as usual. Now, man, this is bad or, or I would like to, in, in some way, in the question is like, why is TS naive, TS is doing some bad? I would like to try to understand this effect of the prior. Um, the, and this is the effect, uh, I forgot the number here, um, the, the, but um, I think it's like 1,000 or 5,000 samples that we have that you use as the prior. Here we have 250, 200, 100, and so on. We are going down. Uh, note here that it's 250. Um, it takes around maybe 2,000 2, uh, rounds, interactions, and you kind of catch up with the blue one that is the traditional to be 50-50. For sure, you have less uncertainty here in the sub, this suboptimal, suboptimal here, the dux1, because we already pulled it a lot in the beginning, but still, in some sense, it's hard to compare, but in some sense, uh, it took around 2,000 rounds to have this sentence. And then you can have the kind of behavior that you keep going, this gets weaker and weaker, in 100, whatever, after 500, you're already able to distinguish in some way, and then whatever, oops. Um, and eventually, by the way, note here that if you keep doing that, is that this, this guy here is deteriorating to the blue one here that I make it shaded, but uh, the one downstairs here. Which, think, think uh, with me, that's, the, that's unbelievable. Because our whole game is like, let me try to get 1 million data points from someone, and then I can leverage or kind of warm up my learning, and then I need to do less experimentation. That's the dream or the goal. Not the dream, the goal. Here, what we're saying is that is these very samples that are hurting. If you as eventually, yeah, I think it's clear in, in some way, which is now I would like to to explain a little bit more about this behavior and, and introduce or start talk about the issues of non-identifiability. This is just the causal graph that we have before, and this is the structural causal model that generated the previous plots. I will not parse one by one. You can do it at home. Um, now, the, what we ended up doing, um, and we know that because we are the system designer, we are trying to understand the issue. Now, this leads, this guy here, this SCM, that is an observed nature, leads to these two different distributions here. There is the L1 distribution that's observation and the L2 distribution that is the experimental. Uh, this is just the behavior that what we have before, that is, we already can see that the dux0 is larger than the dux1. 
this is what we we know after running and uh, th this is what this implies sorry um then it seems to be a bad idea to do the do x0 and we can see also the flip here that the the cx1 is larger than the cx0 those are the number that you have 0301 in practice we don't observe this guy we are playing the game <laughs> we are playing the game exactly because we don't have it if you'd have it well i would go a few slides before you say if they do x maybe 20 if do x is long doing the optimization is trivial i kind of argmax this guy or do some computation on top some type of statistics or function of this distribution the whole challenge that we don't have this guy and the obvious observation from the cht is like this guy here the y given x or the layer one data under the term is layer two data then you don't know what's going on in layer two because there is more information in layer two um now this guy was bad when you knew about the thing but now that you now that we don't and all what we observe this one someone could say huh x1 is looking quite good now because 0 3 versus 0 1 shouldn't i just do it do x1 this is a joke here causal joke here now you guys know as much causal as i do then we are in the same team here of causal team um the joke should i just do it and you put the hand here now this is too important this is a joke this leads to important important questions um how how do i know i i know this pattern is not present in my data that we have this type of behavior that i just showed we don't know that's the challenge we never know does this then imply that i should throw away all the data not collected by me the agent and always learn from scratch there is no hope in generality of running from offline but for these two other modes that are very constrained the the answer is hopefully not because the, the other conditions are very stringent the, the agents and the kind of twin agents and much more than that evolve in the similar way uh, yeah anyhow uh, let me um after all is there any useful information in the observational data and i'll say yes there is useful information and our goal is to try to understand how to leverage this l1 data or confounded data uh, we'll take a very simple approach three-step approach for the problem step one in step one we'll like to extract the causal information from the confounded observations the solution that we take is doing bounding you are not trying to do point identification that get the p of x y and pretend that the y, sorry p of y get x that's computed from that and pretend that this is the same we are trying to bound the y given to x result given observations coming from any distribution p of x and y the average effect is bounded there is this kind of lower and upper bound here that is given by these uh, expressions um, important thing to note in the expression that is those are functions of the observation distribution there is just things about there is no do here no layer two here that's good um now different flavors that you can find about the bounding and others this is the ones that i like or whatever i think more and i it seems to be more related uh linear program format sorry if you already have some result that is related to that let me know um linear program formulation not a causal graphs uh, uh that is not the one that i gave or in other words non-parametric if you don't have any assumption about the f and the p of u we can have this approach here through uh, uh balky and pro or jang and bar and boy uh playing with that in different types of graphs um now incorporation of parametric knowledge if you know a little bit about the f in some testings you could there is this nice paper by by nathan that is also here in new york uh doing nathan carlos uh, and zoo um if you know something about the the SCM, about the the functional form or the u you can get kind of tighter bounds then my origin my suggestion in general is to start from these ones if they, these ones work well that's good or if you feel that they can work well this is good if they are very loose then you can start seeing that what are the the reasonable assumptions that you could use uh in order to speed up learning and you have other settings kind of more involved graphs that will come later second step uh now we need to incorporate these causal bounds into the learning procedure here i'm picking the uh, thompson sampling because it's easy to explain there is the ucb version that is easy to prove some results and we can do in any other method or many other methods uh cause uh, there i'm highlighting the changes here causal bounds that you have for input for each layer for each arm 
and now you have some type of rejection sampling here to guarantee to ascertain that the, the whatever you're sampling from the beta is within the bound. For sure, a uh, nice project here, now a nice question. What about if you have the bounds, I'm assuming that you, sorry, the bounds, I'm assuming that you have tons of observational data. What about if you don't have so much data, uh, you have some kind of finite samples of the observational, now you can be, try to be more careful and put some kind of distribution there, a little bit less strict. There's a very good cool problem, I think is a natural uh, to consider this setting. But anyhow, here you have a rejection sampling kind of thing. Um, now the third question is like, can, what happens in practice? In practice, this works quite ama amazingly well. Uh, the whole game here from the non-convergence that we have for using in a bad way the data, we go to, let's throw away the data, I cannot learn to anything. To a result that this is, I, I can do with my closed eyes, it's very simple. Uh, we can kind of, the point here, I kind of chopping. Now you're discussing about speed of convergence. Uh, we can kind of chop here a lot of this initial exploration. That is the whole goal of the observational data. Then is, is in practice is a very easy instance. If 100, uh, uh, maybe 100 trials here, you already solve the problem. Now, third step in reality is like, uh, the, in, can you order of magnitude imp improvement can be achieved in practice? The step three, I should write separately here. Can you prove that this translates to the regret bounds? You can check the reference. Uh, but um, that, that's the idea. Then first, oh, um, the, let, let me summarize here. I think it's better. The, uh, you have the causal graph here. Uh, you have many observation here. Recall that this is vertical lines, means data points. You have tons of them, 1 million data points. Now we we'll apply this GPL bounding, and you like to, to, to and, and we cannot get point estimate. Then you need to go online uh, and need to do some kind of exploration. Now uh, you have this policy pi that is influenced or is constructed based on this guy. Um, and then you go online and do that. Then the step to do that template here of the task, if the policy is identifiable from offline methods, just return the optimal policy to the do calculus, the combination of IPW and other estimation methods. Um, otherwise, we extract the causal information from the observational data and compose the causal bounds based on the available structure assumptions. Can be assumptions on G or some of the work, our work can be assumptions on the F or the P of U. And go Nathan and so on. Um, now, the, and then you go online, you get offline plus online, you incorporate the causal bounds into the online allocation procedure and play. And the third step is theoretical. If you did it right, you can prove that these are reflect uh, in the regret bounds. That's cool. Um, I'm kind of uh, running out of time here for this task, um, but the, the, uh, I would just like to talk about quickly, quickly about one new result. Uh, there is this setting that is dynamic treatment regimes uh, that is very popular in the medical domain by Susan Murphy and so that has cool result. That is, we have this nature that is X1, X2, and so on. And it's kind of more than IMDP because we have this latent variable here affecting everyone. And it's also not exactly upon the P. Uh, uh, it's more general in some sense, but I, I will not get there. Um, you can read more about the TR and these references and others. Um, and the idea is like now we have a, a, the sequential aspect um, and same thing, but now we have X, Y, and C, where C is the context, S1, S2, and so on. And now we can do GP, oops, we can do GP outbound in there. Uh, and in reality, the results are pretty great. It's very, very technical, gets technical, the proofs, but the results are pretty great. This is randomized, this is by Murphy, a uh, solution that is essentially doing the Fischer and randomization here, or a variation of Fischer and randomization here in the, in the, uh, in this setting, uh, the sequential version of the, the, this randomization. Here we have our our setting here, our kind of uh, uh, solution, uh, just exploiting the, the the structure assumptions that is already in the DTR setting. And this is one, the, the green one, is the one using observational data, which is a piece of cake, essential observation. They that does the job, just kind of made a very cool result. This is the reason that I'm sharing here uh, this paper I like to talk. Uh, or at least to call your attention or, or, or get your attention uh, uh, to check this out. Okay, um, the um, uh, I, I want to move to task two. Um, I'm, I'm slightly over, uh, 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 slow here, but I think it's okay. Um, the second task is when, when and where to intervene. Um, refining the policy space. This is work of Sangak League, my postdoc. A postdoc in my lab, the causal AI lab, uh, 
very nice work with him and he helped a lot in the presentation the other parts here all over the place and thanks to Sangak. Um, the, the when and where to intervene, uh, in general, it's assumed throughout the literature a policy space such that actions are fixed a priori. Uh, for example, we have a set X that have X1, X2, XK and intervene is usually uh, assumed to lead to positive outcomes. Usually assume that interventions are good. Uh, our goal here in this task is to understand when interventions are required or if they may lead to unintended consequences. Uh, consequences, side effects, maybe they are with, want to destroy humanity, there's issues of safety and so on. Then this is the, the, the task, um, the practical part of the task. In the case, interventions may, need, may be needed on the other hand. And we would like to understand what should be changed in the underlying environment so as to bring about a desired state of affairs. Uh, maybe you should just touch X1 or intervene or shake the things up in X1, X3, and X7 instead of doing the intervention, no levers. You told me that the K there is seven. You have the seven levers. Maybe you shouldn't touch uh, the other four. Uh, this is more related to the when, and this is related to the where. Um, let me, let me to ground here, let me try to uh, understand, uh, give an example uh, and understand what is the policy space. Uh, consider the graph bended model X is the decision, Y is the outcome, and use this load or the in the Sutton and Barto in the first chapter, second is the the mean and the variance of the Gaussian, or this is the kind of the parameterization of the reward. Um, this is the bandit. Stick with it. I, I like to uh, compare. Our goal here is to optimize the variable y or the reward, keep it as high as high as possible. Perhaps this is some uh, um, the health of the system, of the wealth, for the happiness, and so on, of the society. Uh, and we are our uh, bottom line of the company, and we are not a priori committed to intervene on any specific variable. We just want to keep the Y high uh, or intervening at all. Now, I would like to consider the following deviation from this setting with instead of two variables that bandits are working, at least if you want to go online, let's get with three variables. And this is the model that we have. Z affects the variable X and in turn X affects Y. Then in structure, the mechanism in this system, F of X is a function of Z and U. And y, f of y, is equal to x and u. And z is f of z of u sub z. Now, this is the causal graph. And the policy space here um, is this, this one. I'm just kind of writing the combinations. The empty intervention not touching the system, allow it to naturally evolve. And you can have an intervention. Excuse me. One option here is do x. The other option is do z. The other option is do x, do z for whatever values we have. Now, the relation here is some kind of one is the subset of the other. Some kind of transitive reduction there. But um, OK, now I would like to, to examine um, uh, the following policy, one that I like to call the causal insensitive strategy or policy that we ignore the causal structure G. You take this variable Z and X uh, uh, as a big variable. And you'll we'll be trying to search, optimize, based on this function here, the e of pi of y do x z. Do x is equal to small x, z is equal to small z. First observation here, note that the implicit causal graph in the agent's mind, g prime, which follows from this standard optimization procedure, uh, uh, is different than g. Uh, but first, this is the graph that is in the agent mind coming from this uh, optimization fear that we have z and x. There's nothing pointing to that, just the pi that is deciding the value of z and x, and this is changing y, and there is this kind of load of uh, the parameterization of the reward function here that is the u. And this is different, this g prime is different than the 2g that is in the environment. Uh, I hope it's clear. Now, the, the true causal model g encodes the constraints of the underlying environment. That's another observation. This graph here is the one that is evaluated, or at least the uh, mechanisms are following this topology here. He got us of you applying and submitting it for this algorithm or using this function, observation. Now, question here, or naive question, or not so naive. Um, despite what, I cannot look myself, this is the tough one about recording, I like to be in person, but appreciate to be online and you guys be here. It's 
because I move a lot and, and, and so on, move my hands. And, um, the, 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 the reasonable question here is despite what is in the agent's mind or the optimization function, it is still the case that it will be evaluated by the SMM. Just repeat the point. Is then being oblivious to the pair GM, okay? Elia is comma. Can't we just do more, more interventions? In other words, more do access, do Zs, and things will eventually converge. Um, this is why I'm saying that uh, is uh, insensitive. Um, I would like to, to, to show that this is not the case. Historical comment, this came from the, maybe five years ago, four. I was visiting many places, including uh, Universal Alberta, Alberta, that's very nice with me. I have a good time there. And this coming from a dinner, hit the dinner about, oh, do you need causality or need reinforcement learning? How is it related and so on? And I was going back after this dinner to my hotel. And then the following example will come out. This, this is the example that came out. And uh, it took my one or two years until we could read the, write the paper in generality. Um, but uh, this is the example here. Um, and I appreciate a lot uh, the discussion. Um, th this is the causal graph. Now I'll show you a causal model that is exactly compatible with this graph here. Let's bear with me. Z is equal to UZ. There is no parent, just exogenous variations. X is the F of X of the, this X. F of X is listening to Z and the U. And Y, and, and it turns out to be equal to Z plus U. Z, X, or U. Not two, but I will say plus. Um, and Y is X plus U. And the probability distribution of U equal to 1 turns out to be equal to probability of UZ is equal to 1, that is equal to half. Usually you don't put the UZ by parentheses. Usually you don't put it because it's just affecting one. You just put the confounders that affect more than one observables. Close parentheses. But now that's the parameterization. Now what's going on in this parameterization? First, let's evaluate the naive, or the, sorry, the causal insensitive policy. That is first observation that the Y given do XZ turns out to be equal to Y given do X. I will defend that later in two minutes. But the idea is that all the interventions that you do uh, on X, Z is blocked from Y because you are picking the value of X and this doesn't leak to Y in this case. But how do we evaluate that? Y is equal to X plus U. Let's say that we are doing P of Y given to X is equal to 1. Then this is 1 plus U. 1 plus U is equal to not U. You want to keep the value of Y as high as possible. Uh, uh, in other words, 1. Then we need to U equal to 0 because 1 plus 0 is equal to 1, um, and this will happen with probability half. On the other, same argument applies with the 0 here. If we have u is equal to, uh, sorry, uh, x is equal to 0, y will be equal to u, and the same thing, u need to be equal to 1, uh, then this is half. Then this large fraction of time, uh, whatever intervention we do in the do x or do x z, the maximum amount that you can get is 0 0.5. Um, now, I would like to contrast that with the intervention do Z. Oops. I would like to intervention with do Z. Now, what happens in do Z? X is free to vary as it wants, or as it naturally goes. Then Z will have some value. X will be this value plus U. Y will be equal to Z plus U, whatever value, plus U. Just doing the replacement. Which turns out U plus U is zero, which turns out to be equal to Z then. Then... If you decide to do, do z is equal to 1, e of, e of y will be equal to 1. The, it was an awesome dinner. I'm very ha glad. I was so happy with this one. Not so happy with my own speed. It takes time but to, to write the paper. But um, the, the observation here is that the causal insensitive strategy, we call all at once because we got everything that you can interview, all, all levers that you can touch, and we fix the value, we just keep varying the values. We'll not pick up the do z intervention and we'll never converge. And those are the plots here by, by the cumulative regret and the probability of picking the correct action. Now, for the, for the do z, there is a little bit of exploration here because we need to know what is the value of z, but it's easy. They are at once, we we'll never pick up the right answer. Now, someone could come and say, uh, okay, Elias, but um, the, the, ah, by, by the way, I don't buy it. My, my, my comp personally, it doesn't matter, but personally, I'll tell you that that's the strategy that we have, strategy that we have by and large in the literature. But after seeing that, 
I got comments when you present the paper, you went to the RIPS, the other conference. Um, people go, oh, okay, if this is happening, then let me do all the subsets. This is what we want to do since ours. Then this is all the, all the subsets, which obviously will catch the DUZ. You have the power set there and DUZ is a part of the intervene. Then this is the behavior. Now, I don't buy it, but whatever. Let's say that it's true, that you could catch that. Uh, now the question, the productive question here is like, can we do better than these two naive strategies? They're kind of unbelievable strategies in some way. Um, and so it's yes. Uh, just like to discuss your ground. Policy space, we have the graph, the policy space, and now we have the intervention set for each element of this guy. And in reality, the actions is like uh, uh, intervention set empty. We have the do empty. That is the layer one, C, L1. The do X is the do X zero, do X one. Uh, the quick note here, I'm in the binary case. Um, this is already the most constrained setting, the same as before. Then if you give it more degrees of freedom, we can show whatever you want. Uh, uh, it will, this will happen in a more acute way. Um, in, um, but uh, but anyhow, the, the, and then you have whatever combinations we have. Uh, for sure from, the, from the, the, the original naive one, you have two to the n, now you have three to the n because we have the superset and all, the, all the, the, the superset and the assignments for this one that is here. Now, for sure, I'll go with the paper. This is motivations in the introduction of the paper. If you read uh, with Sanghak, um, we would like to study the properties of the policy space with respect to the topological constraints imposed by M and G. That's the hard work here that I have lifting uh, thanks to Sanghak. Uh, property one that we have, we already alluded to this one, that y given to x and z is equal to y given to x. Now, if you get this, the, the causal calculus, the do calculus or the soft do calculus, we cut, this means that this graph here is cutting the incoming arrows to z and x. Z has nothing, x has this arrow cut here, and then z is separated from y, uh, z is separated from y given x. Now, if that's true, we can prove that this will be true. Uh, implication here that you prefer of playing do x to playing do x z. z. There's no point in wasting samples of interactions, trying the combinations that will be the same. This leads us to the definition that is the first definition, the key one here in the, the, the second key, but um, or the building block in the paper that is giving x, uh, g, and y, sorry, given g and y, a set of variables x that observables that is not y is said to be a minimal intervention set if there is no proper subset x prime such that the y do x prime is equal to the do y do x for the graph that is compatible uh, for the SCM that is compatible with the graph uh, which is the case uh, let me show it okay uh, sorry we just have this missed column here it turns out that this do x z that is the set that is x that has achieves the same maximum expected reward then you can just cut this guy here in the policy space this is a refinement this is the example of the miss minimal intervention set now, second property that is very cool. Now we like to compare, <clears throat> sorry. Now we like to compare the expected reward among the misses. And let's consider the expected reward of the observation E of Y. Uh, and then you can write E of Y, uh, Y given Z times PZ. In reality, I will do expected value, but also it turns out that this is the do Z here, just because it will be used later. Now, it turns out that this guy is bound later now. This bounded, uh, upper bounded by the one that if you pick the best inter the best value of z. Now, given that this best is insensitive to the value of z, you can pull out this guy out, and then you have this y given do z star, which implies the e of y is less or equal to the e of y given do z star. Then the implication here is that playing do z should we prefer to play nothing of the. This is a case, uh, this, for this particular graph, uh, it all, always good deal to intervene. If you allow the system to evolve naturally, it can be terrible. That's the idea here. There are examples that this is not the case. The best thing is just to allow, but this is an example that uh, interventions are, are needed. Now, this leads or motivates us to the following definition, uh, possibly optimal miss, PONIS, as you call, Given this pair G, y, G and Y, with the graph G and the outcome Y, and let X be the, a miss. X is said to be a possibly optimal miss. If there exists a SCM, this is quantifying, there exists, is important. 
ISCM conform to G such that the maximum that we can get here with this X is greater than the maximum that we can get for all other Miss W. Now, this particular case here is the one that this is the, not the case because we just showed the example that the do Z dominates the Y. No, ma no, matter what is, no matter what's the SCM, for all possible SCMs. Then uh, we could rule out, it turns out that how you prove that is an another way. Here we're just showing that Y or the no intervention, non intervene, it is not a promise, just for the sake of understanding. Now you can go to the paper. Uh, there is some, some non-trivial treatment here. You provide a complete, a if and only if, characterization of the promise and algorithm that is capable of listing all the promise given a causal graph. Now, in our policy space here, we are able to remove here, and now this is no longer a contender. Note here also that I just removed this guy here. Now, these two guys here, in particular in this graph, both the do X and the do Z are contenders, which means that based on the topology, the G that is in the agent's mind, in the agent's side, not in the environment, it cannot disambiguate who is best. Now you need to go online and try both. Now we are, at least for this particular case, you need to try these four guys here. We already seen one case, I just pick one instance that came from the dinner, that is the one that the do Z is better than do X, because it's a surprising one. But there are, it's easy to construct. There are SCMs or models of the environment that are some that the X is better than the Z. Why, by the way, one quick note here. <clears throat> why, why this is not surprising, the do X, the do Z? Because our intuition is that why is the guy that is the best variable, the best, sorry, the reward variable that you want to keep it high? Now, it is natural to think that in order to keep Y high, that I would like to have more controllability over Y. Then I will pick the variable that is closest to Y. In this case, it's X. Then if I can control X, I'm able to control Y. If I keep going further from Y, it, it seems that I lose control. Maybe I will keep going so much that I go to the mom, to the baby in the womb of the mom. Then you say, perhaps I do intervention there and I have an effect about the salary of the student 24 years later. That's more difficult to see. Then you have this strong intuition that if I'm able to control the guy that is closest, this is always best. It turns out that the naive strategy, the first naive, they all at once do X, Z, turns out, as we discussed, to be equal to the do X. Then it seems to be the case that, or I do this naive, but in reality, I'm doing this thing that is the closest, that is my intuition before the dinner. Now, after the dinner, I say, wow, man, there are cases that we need to go a little bit later, later and, and do the do Z. And I'll be messing up if I touch in the X here. I would like you to think about what went wrong in this example with the X or example when you do the intervention in the do Z. Why I don't want to touch the X? What I will be making a mistake or messing up in order to get the intuition. But anyhow, that's the context here. It turns out that for Mark, it is always the all at once and or getting closer to the, the, the variable is through in Markovian systems. If you don't have a U like that, a latent variable like that, um, is not true if you start having parts of the system that you don't observe. That is our belief here. Uh, otherwise, everything will be too simple. I can even use the offline method that we have before to solve the problem, always. Then there's no even point in doing uh, experimentation. You can always exploit. But anyhow, sorry, this is long parenthesis. Let's come back here to the, the thing. The palm is, uh, observation, the pommes, th these arms here, they share, they are not independent. Then I will go quickly here because I ended up getting the tangent. But there is some connection between these arms. Let me skip here what it is here. I just get a more involved graph here that allows us to show what I want. Suppose that you want to learn about the arm C, this do C here. Now it turns out that whenever you pull the do B, that is this guy here, we also can learn about the do C. That's so cool. Or the no intervention here that allow the C, you can learn from whenever you do the intervention B. And already whenever you did the intervention C, you can learn about the no intervention. And that, that's cool, and that's the idea. I'll not get into the details. The point is there is some way of connecting these guys, and there is an identification algorithm called z square uh, uh, that is cool for that. Um, I also skip this one. It's just that we have samples. I skip, let me say, uh, 30, 30 seconds here. 
the samples that were the number of samples for each of the arms. This is no arm. This is do B, do C. They have different whatever you pull different numbers of times. Then there are different variances. Then we are trying to do some type of inverse of the variance, given that we have more certainty in the guys that you pull more. And those guys here are the formulas that connect the arms that you like to leverage. And the samples are not independent. Then there is some kind of nice way of connecting them. Um, we can incorporate in any type of uh, online algorithm. We just did in the basic one to show that this is the case, that it works. Um, this is just the natural. We don't even show the naive one, the first naive that is all at once. This is the brute force. This is the miss. This is the blue is the pumice and the, the, the green is the one use the other arms that we're trying to get as much juice or be as sample efficient as possible. Um, this is just simulation. Some people like to see the simulation. Uh, that's the task. We have the causal graph. We are not using the data from task one. We could. Um, and now we are learning the pumice and the formulas that connect the arms. And then we um, want to use that while we are collecting the data. Now, oh man. I would like just to mention quickly a new result that is, I think is so cool and exciting. In addition to decide where to intervene, but I will do it fast. Um, in addition to deciding where to intervene, agents also need to decide where to look. Agents are bombarded with information and they need to be, uh, uh, um, um, how I, I say, um, about careful about which places they, should, they, they will be looking into. Then our selective, oh, the word is selective that I was looking for. Now, here, suppose that you have a causal graph that you have this context C. Now, both in C and X1 could be context. Then this is this is her kind of policy that if you consider that X1 is listening to C and X2 is listening to X1, this is one policy. Another policy could be uh, X1, we allow it to naturally vary, no intervention in X1, and X2 just listens to X1, to X2 just listens to C. Then you can have many policies like that about what you decide to see and where you decide to do. Then give this, this gives right to this, this policy space here. Um, uh, the, the X2, if you're considering the do X2, X2 doesn't listen to N1, X2 listens to C, X2 listens to X1, and so on. Now, the nice thing about this piece of work that I, I think is not uh, cool is that there is some kind of structure or there is something equivalent, equivalence class in the policy uh, uh, in the policy space. Policy with the same maximum expected row can be clustered in an equivalence class. Now, you can do filtering in the kind of similar way as the miss and the promise. You have the minimal policy among these QR equivalence policies. That is this guy highlighted here. Uh, and you can have some type of partial order between the policies. And now you can identify the policy, like the policy, po po possibly optimal policy among the minimal policies that are the ones that are looking to la num last number of places. Then out of these 15, that's quite challenging. With the graph with three nodes, we, we reduce that to two. Then if you're interested in the details, this is the R63. Take a look. I think it's a cool uh paper but you you tell me <clears throat> let me get um um now i would like to talk about this task three this is the counterfactual decision making this is work with uh, my friend andrew forney and you the pro um, chronologically, this was the first task that appeared in CRL around 14, 15. And, um, and I think it's an a, a interesting one. I would like to, uh, you to, to think about that, that we are going to go into layer three now. Uh, the agents usually act in a reflexive manner without considering the reasons or the causes uh, for behaving in a particular way. Whenever this is the case, they can be exploited without never realizing it. This is general phenomena that uh, uh, in online learning, whenever the agents optimize based on the Fisher and randomization, what I mean is like, uh, in other words, they do distribution, uh, which includes all uh, non LRLC settings that are non causal, causal insensitive, They're ignoring the causal structure. Um, and here, this Fisher in the sense that this is how it started the idea of doing the intervention in the system that you decide to flip the coin. Now, in the context of the, the crops, the yield of the crops and the pesticides with the farmers because of the confounding bias by fish around 1935. I believe that is, I, I read the history as being the precursors of that, of reinforcement learning. 
And we have the paper by Robbins in 1952 with the stopping problem, uh, how many samples I need to be able to distinguish these things. You start then, we have the UCB of Lyon Robbins in 83, and then you go on for the modern literature. And you have the MDP on the other side um, doing dynamic programming and so on, connected with that online or leveraging that. Uh, but anyhow, I could talk half an hour about history. Um, the, the, the point being that you are using kind of L3 or Fisher and L2, L2 randomization. I go here to endow agents with the capability of performing counterfactual reasoning, taking their own intent into account, which leads to a more refined notion of regret and a new optimization uh, L3 type of function. Um, <clears throat> counterfactual decision making, the question that we are trying to answer is how should one select the treat max star to a particular unit, u is equal to u, so as to maximize the expected reward y. Here's the graph that we have. We have the x, we have the y, and you have the u. Now we're calling the unit u. Now we are not interested in the in the having the average effect y given to x, that is the average over the u for all population. I'm taking whatever, this is the unit. Uh, we are trying to this particular u. This person with this age, sex, uh, sorry, age, gender, ethnicity, uh, uh, and all the buckets that make the person individual. Um, uh, secondary question is, if, what if you have observational, they lay L1 and L2 data. Applications are many in robotics uh, when the robots start having their own intent. And, uh, and what I mean by that is like, as we, we just decide and sometimes we just want to do something and we don't even know the reason that we want to do this thing. At the time, I think in the near future, robots may have this one, they don't know exactly what's the, imp the input that is, they are making them to act in some way. Uh, then it's pretty much similar to the human being here in this situation, uh, is where counterfactuals emerge. But uh, it's enough for now. Medical treatment, the personalized medicine, uh, job training program to see that this particular individual, what's the effect of the, uh, the retraining program to this person. Now, in order to ground this discussion, I would like to talk about the greedy casino that is coming from this paper in the RIPS 15. Um, I'm thankful because reviewers allowed us to put an exotic example that I like a lot. There's a lot of discussion at the time. Uh, we ended up getting lucky. But uh, the, the question is, lucky me, the work I think is good. Uh, lucky in the sense that it is, it is a, a interesting story that I'll tell you now. Um, <clears throat> the goal is to find a policy pie so as to minimize the cumulative regret. Um, the casino hires a, a team of uh, experts, sociologists, psychologists, cognitive science, to understand the behavior of the humans or the the... the the customers in the casino floor. And these customers, uh, you pay uh, 5 million bucks. Uh, these teams of experts, they, they, they go there. After three months, they come back with two big conclusions uh, uh, to justify the money, I would say in some way. Um, you could have asked me. The first one, that the determined factor of the behavior of the humans in the casino floor is the drunkenness level of the person, whether they are drunk or not, given some threshold. And the second bullet is like, for this population, if they are drunk, usually they are attracted to more effusive things, things that are calling attention. Like if there is a machine that is making noise, noise and blinking, people that is drunk is attracted to that. And on the other hand, if the person is not drunk, usually they're in the shy mode and they, they are avoiding, they are going to the machines that are not blinking or not making noise. That's the conclusion of the study. Now we have this EVO or the greedy casino that um, decide to leverage that. Uh, the casino have two types of machine, machine X0 and machine X1. You have the reward Y0 and Y1, that is not winning and winning. And now we have this unobserved variable blinking machine, if the machine is blinking or not blinking. Um, and uh, both machines can be blinking or not, just with different likelihoods. And you also have the drunkenness level, if the person is drunk or not. Both of these guys don't remember, remember the notation dashed here, dashed arrows and bidirected. This is the U. U unobserved is equal to B and D. Now observe for us, unobserve for us. Um, quick note here. There is a regulation in Nevada that says that the payout has to be at least 30% of the time. Casino, whatever, that's the regulation. The casino learn how the customers operate based uh, uh, operate here. Uh, based on these things that came from the study, these conclusions from the study, and decide to, say the pay, to set the payout pay structure as follows using machine learning. 
the 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 casino have these two different types of machine machines x0 and x1 in the casino floor and the machines may be blinking or not blinking now because they, they they hire people here in the community computer vision that were so great and uh and the machines have a camera that take a picture of the pulpo of the guys of the the guys or the ladies or the fellows and get the dilation of the pulpo to decide to know if they are drunk or not as some uh given some threshold then this is a simplified story by the way you go to the paper but there is more refined versions of that now the the based on the dilation you can know if they are uh, drunk or not if the machine is already blinking and the person is drunk they will put a lower payout if the machine is not drink not, not blinking and the person is not drunk they will have a lower payout as well in other words if the people is following whatever they discover that is the natural predilections or the nature natural way this the human subjects operate in this the casino uh people get screwed this is a, a trap this is why i call the greedy casino now we don't know anything i just copy here the, the parameterization we don't know anything about that this is the underlying scm uh we arrived this is around 14 15 we go that uh 40 uh, per we go down the casino after the conference not doing to have a drinks and then we decide to do the following. We have at night, we don't have anything better to do. And we decide to do random sampling from the casino floor to try to understand what's going on in this game with this type of machines. Now we start with plot picking samples at random. You pick, you pick the subject and you follow the subject of our eye, the unit, and then you take note. The guy play X1, machine type one, and he got not winning. Why one? This other, we pick another guy at random. They got X0 and he is not winning. Or this, and then you do that 10,000 times. You do a random sample, you collect L1 type of data. This is kind of the graph that you preserve. Uh, we have no clue again, sorry, no clue about the BND. The only thing that you can see is the action that is the X and the outcome Y. Lo and behold, you get this 10,000 data points for the data set D1, and this is what the statistics come. The E of Y given X is equal to zero is equal to X is equal to one of winning, that is 15% of the time. You say, aha, we know that we are already suspicious here that something is wrong. Uh, let's call the, the Nevada game here commission because we know that they need to pay the folks 30% of the time. We are already kind of suspicious with the level of service here in this casino and power is not good. It's, it's something wrong here, kind of shady. Then what we do is like we call this, the inspector come in the second day of the conference and does the following. He say, we show the data do you want to them and ask how did you collect this data fellows uh, uh and and we say oh we do a random sample you're careful about being really random uh, and then they uh, so on and they they say oh you don't understand anything about experimental design let's be serious here and i'll do a randomized control trial because i read fisher design of experiments i'll do randomized control trial on the casino floor let's do like the fda that is serious about causality lo and behold he does he does do that and he ended up getting this data set. Randomization two step, random sample, flip the coin. The coin is the pi here. The decides, we even talk in the first part about the ran. You flip the coin, the coin ran ended up being one. This is do x equal to one. The coin ended up being zero. This is do x equal to zero. Lo and behold, we end up getting these statistics with 3000 samples. He even comes to us and say, guys, you don't know experimental design or anything because we've collected 10,000 data points. I already have good bars here. And with 3,000, I already can, can get the answer. And the casino is kosher. This is a capitalist business. Uh, uh, it's true that they are not giving one dime, additional dime to the customers, but they're online and everything is fine. Don't bother us here in the Nevada Commission because we have more important things to do. And they throw the data in our face and leave in an abrupt way. That's, uh, you know, that's the story, the way that I like the story. Um, now, we, we question for us here is like we're in the third day of the casino. We are studying students on machine learning. And now we have these two data sets. And the question is like, now we want to play the game. Oops. We want to play the game. But may, are, are we, uh, what, what should we do? Should we operate as, are we exchangeable? Are you like the usual population that is in the casino? And, uh, uh, and you should just go there and do whatever you want. We don't know that being the effects and what will happen are we exchangeable there's interesting puzzle here because now that you already seen this data these other guys didn't see the data because they didn't collect before 
that are re-exchangeable. There's an interesting puzzle here um, that is quite cool, but um, I, will, I will skip. Now, the point is, like, assume, let's assume that it's exchangeable. We'll be kind of experiencing this level of uh, regret or reward. Um, if you just decide to flip coins, you get this point 0.3. Then you say, no, neither is quite good. I know more. I took my machine learning class. I use one of these. I know that it's stateless. Then I will, take, I, I will use one of the algorithms that you, I understand well. And, uh, and I'll do as exploration. I identify which arm is good. And this is what we get. That's the, the, the number of interactions. This is the probability of picking the correct actions. And this is the cumulative regret. Oracle minus what we're doing, while Oracle environment is the SCM. And this that I just showed before. And this is what we get, essentially no learning. Probability of picking the correct action is 0.5. And you have some type of linear regret here. Sounds pretty terrible. And we are kind of disappointed because this is exactly the same as the, the coin flip of the guy that came in the second day, the inspector from the, the, the commission. And we thought that we are better than him. Um, we said, wow, I'm a sample efficient. Fisher is good that you are able to get the randomization, but uh, we like more the Robbins paper of 53 or the 82 that is doing this uh, uh, sample efficient thing. Uh, but the result are a little bit disappointing. The bandits minimize the short term regret based on the due distribution. That's the observation here. Now, proposal, we arrive in the, in the fourth day, and you'll try to use our knowledge after having brainstorming and getting talks and causal inference. Let's say, oh, let's try to do L3 something. Because we know that L3, we have in our gut that L3 is more detailed. It's talking more about the SCM than layer two. Now, we have this RDC here that we call the regret decision criterion that we're trying to find a star that optimizes this guy here. Let me read this counterfactual sentence here. They say, expected value of Y had X being X1, given that X is equal to X0. Now, given that you play machine X0, I would like to know, I already play machine X0, I would like to know what would be my outcome, why had I played machine X1. Um, this is known in the literature for many years, this quantity at least called the effect of treated on the treated, ETT. It's like, no, no, counterfactual. L3 has many counterfactuals. This is one of the elements in the zoo. Now, this is in contrast to what we we're doing before that was Y given do X. That in reality can be written in layer 3 notation Y sub X is equal to X. This is L2 uh, quantity in L3 notation. It's also called, called the counterfactual, but too weak because L2, well, ju we will just call the do. But anyhow, just so you to know that this is the same, we just don't have this condition in here. Now, observation that, okay, sounds good. Why we don't use that? The problem is if general counterfactuals, counterfactuals are difficult or impossible, most time impossible to evaluate from data, even if you have interventional capability, ex except for some special conditions, such as if the variables are binary, if the backdoor condition holds, unconfoundedness, and so on. You can go to Pro Causality 2000, Pro 2000, Chapter 9, there is discussion on that. But what we know from causality, that this is L3, but it's hard to evaluate. Well, almost impossible. Now, here comes the trick that is the, 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 the main contribution of the paper. It's a conceptual one and operational. Um, <clears throat> how, how could we evaluate expression like that? That has this collision of world. Uh, given that I play machine X0, what would be the value of Y had X being X1? Now, note here that the agent is about to machine, play machine X0, it is about to play machine X0, which means that the unknown function F sub, F sub X of BD, recall, you have the U that in this case is BD, blinkness and drunkness, affecting the X. It could be one million dimension, but there is this B, U affecting X. Now, affecting means that X, you evaluate at F of X of this particular instantiation of BD that you don't observe. In this case, is about to play X0. This is the evaluation. Now we pause, interrupt the decision flow, and wonder. I am about to play machine X0. Would I be better off going with my gut, with my intuition X0, or should I go against it, X1? That's the first time that I, I can envision that the AI is saying, I am about to do something. I want to do something, and I don't know the reason. This is the whole point. But, but uh, one one parenthesis, guys. Don't don't don't. 
I want you to stay here in line, but just you could do this comma context or state equal to C because everything that the agent knows what's affecting it, this will take into account here. They will be exactly the same. Here, there is this B and D, and my claim that in, in human decision-making and in the future AI decision-making, there is always this U that is also affecting the X and Y. In human, is obvious. This is the whole industry, or advertisement industry, or negotiation, you are or the advertisement. I mean, they, we are trying to create these correlations and make the, the trick the people to have this kind of feeling that, and they will lead them to some decision without they knowing what, why they, they are doing something. Here's exactly the same. Now, close parentheses. I can elaborate in the question. Let's go back. I am about, I am the agent. I want to play Machine X Zero. Just want. It. That's like what I feel. Now I stop my urge and I say, would I be better off going with my gut or should I go against it? Now, if then this is step number two, we do not interrupt and you allow X Zero to be X big equal to X Zero. We are doing like the automata, like the quote unquote monkeys in the first day, the data set D1. That people just, I want to play the machine, I'm going to play the machine. Now, if you do stop, you do interrupt, and you make X is equal to rand, you just flip the coin, we are kind of untangling this thing. We are re removing the effect of you. Then this gives rise to the do distribution. That's the Fisher genius, amazing. I'm a big fan of the work. There are some other, but they, this open up the whole literature. From the 30s um they that's good now fisher is saying i don't want the you we are saying something else we're saying you do interrupt you do the x is equal to the rand but now you do rand you get x1 but you say but i wanted to do x0 why because the x0 that we want has information about the latent space that i don't have access to then this turns out we can show that formally but this turns out to be equal to exactly the meaning of this particular counterfactual y sub x1 given x0. And then they, that's what we are kind of pushing or saying, this should be the criterion. Now, if you are a, a philosophical inclined or decision theorist, turns out that each of these one, there is the DT, there is the CDT, those are different types of decision theory. People would like to say that CDT is better. We have all kinds of paradox that sometimes CDT is better. In reality, it is an interesting discussion, even though CDT obviously is in general better. But on top to always, RDT is exactly the combination of these two. It's the sweet spot. Uh, we, are, we are combining both. We are, we are, the, the joke here that I usually do use is like Fisher drug, pun intended, because it's using the drug concept randomized control, Fisher drug of doing the randomization to avoid the confounding bias here of the pesticides and the crops and the bias of the, the farmers. Uh, it was too strong because it completely removed the effect of the U, the latent which you want in some way that could be bad, but we want a little bit too, and this is the, the meaning of the counterfactual, layer three, this kind of layer three counterfactual. Then if you do that, you get this kind of, I just collapsed here the previous one that was L2, you get the blue line, that essentially you are able to converge as expected. Eventually you have this kind of nice behavior that you are able to learn what's the best policy. Uh, and you have also, we could use data from the first day, like the data set one from the people in the casino floor, we can get a bump here, because the, the, same, the same as I said in task two, this, there is some kind of relationship between the arms. Then you can leverage and get a little bit of juice. I like more from going from the red to obviously, from the, gra the red to the blue, because I think uh, at the time, uh, you and I were kind of very surprised with having this type of counterfactual randomization in concert to Fisher and randomization. But this is still cool. And now, once you have established the consistency of the procedure. Now the game is to put curves on top of this one here. For sure, you like to converge faster. Um, then you can do the same combining, not only the, the data set D1 that is observational, but you can combine uh, data set D2 that is experimental. The same way, there's some kind of constraints there that allows us to put one curve on the top of the other. Now, this is the task. Uh, in reality, we can ignore the data or not. I just mentioned not, but uh, the, the, the dimension here is like there is a new there is a new task, uh, a new type of pi that take the X prime into account that is evaluate, evaluation of the U. We detach uh, the evaluation of the U from the action that you'll be committing under this counterfactual randomization. We still need the coin. It's just we need to be clever and understand what it means that then everyone now can do counterfactual randomization. Um, <clears throat> there's an interesting consequence here. I, I'm going really quick now. 
as a new piece of work, uh, application of human AI collaboration, or the, the human is this one slide summary. Uh, can humans be left out of the loop? When do you need the human? Now, that's an interesting question. Of a simple observation from the RDC, from what we discussed here on the regret decisions criteria. If the y sub x given x prime is equal to the y given x, y given do x, this means that the human intuition has no value. There's no information in the gut. Then if that's the case, the, in other words, the human expert could be replaced without sacrifi sacrificing the performance of the system. At least, in other words, at least in principle, full autonomy, autonomy can be achieved in the context that this holds here. Then it's nice to have this condition. In the paper, in this paper, we can go to 64 or 64, uh, the contribution that is the Markov properties L2, layers L2, L3, that helps us to establish whether the agent or the, the agent embedded in some type of environment can be autonomous or not. There is a discussion about optimality of agent layer two, that is experimental, interventional, and counterfactual agent versus autonomy, and for different types of environments. We're trying to be general here in terms of what are the environments, and we have kind of nice results in the sense, yeah, there's no surprise result, but this is my last slide here, and I'll go to this, the conclusion. Um, there is this nice result that the human, if you compare the human that is red versus or the coin or the, the layer two kind of randomization, human is much worse than the coin. Now, usually before this criterion, if the human is worse, the human is worse than the, the machine itself, it seems that the human can be uh, kicked out. But it is possible that the human is worse, but this equality here doesn't hold which means that there is still information in the human, which is this purple line here, that can be leveraged by the counterfactual agent. And I think it's a beautiful result. Um, and, uh, and there are many refinements that I, I envision uh, if you are interested uh, and you are thinking, but there is, uh, I, well, I think it's an important task and, and, uh, 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 in the future about human AI, uh, uh, very sober and, and solid uh, work. And there's also the question about uh, if it's not autonomous, can be semi-autonomous, that you have some type of budget to consult the human. Um, the, the, that the human and the AI has some kind of complementary capabilities. Um, that's cool. Um, now I would like to, I have more two or three, three slides or so. Um, wake up here if you're uh, still with me, thanks for uh, surviving and for being so brave. Um, usually I say that in class, be a hero. Um, summary of RL um, or CRL capabilities. The first one that we discuss, our first task is like online learning is too costly and learning from scratch is usually impractical. Still, the assumptions of offline learning are rather satisfied in practice. So it seems hard situation. Um, the goal here is to move towards more realistic learning uh, scenarios where the two modalities come together and we like to extract as much as uh, as much causal information as possible from the confounded data, or more broadly, from the imperfect data, if you're in the data fusion kind of mood, and using it embedded in the most efficient way. Um, then you have the second task, that is when and where to intervene. Agents, you, agents usually uh, have a fixed policy space, a fixed set of actions, and intervene is, a, is usually assumed to be uh, assumed beneficial. Uh, there's a typo here, I think. This is state of affairs, this is our goal observation. Our goal here is to understand when interventions are needed and whenever this is the case, uh, what should be changed in the system uh, in a more surgical way so as to bring about the desirable uh, outcome. Um, the third task is counterfactual decision making that is related to intentionality, regret, and free will. If you want to ask me, or autonomy uh, as well. Um, the agents will only have autonomy they, when they start to ask, I'm about to do that. I don't know why. What we're, this is the emergency. You can ask me to connect with Harari and many other cool stuff, but this is the, 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 the key point. But uh, let me focus. Um, no, no tangents, Elias. Um, imagine my students sometimes suffering, huh? The uh, my defense is a rich topic. Um, <laughs> agents uh, act in a reflexive manner without considering the reasons or the causes for behaving a certain way. 
the goal here is to endow agents with the capability of taking their own intent into account, which will lead to a new notion of regret based on the counterfactual randomization with implications uh, uh, throughout. Um, the third task that I didn't talk much, uh, just mentioned in the beginning, is generalizability or having a general, generalizable and robust decision making. Uh, knowledge acquired by an agent is usually circumscribed to the domain where it was deployed. Our goal is to agents, the agents to extrapolate knowledge, making more robust and generalizable claim, claims by leveraging the causal structural invariances that are shared across the environments. Very cool work. This is my initial how I started even in the problem of transportability and how to leverage the structural invariances. Um, the fifth problem or fifth dimension, I would say, um, learning causal models by combining observations and experiments. Agents have a fixed causal model constructed from the templates. It could be a multi arm bandit, it could be a Markov decision process, it could be the instrumental variable, and so on. Uh, the front door, the back door, and you have napkin, and so on or from fixed background knowledge, as we discussed. Now the goal here is to allow the agents to systematically combine the observations and intervention that is already constructing, sorry, is already collecting to construct an equivalent class, equivalence class, or eventually a causal model, by equivalence class of causal models. Uh, check the work by Amin Jabber as well, is another one that I didn't cite here, I think explicitly. It's pretty cool about the equivalence class and causal models. Go to the causal AI, Jabber, J-A-B-E-R. Um, Causal imitation learning. Mimicking is one, of the common, is one of the most common ways of learning. Whenever the demonstrator has a different causal model, imitation may lead to disastrous side effects. Our goal here is to understand the conditions so that imitation by behavioral cloning, most common, uh, is valid and leads to faster learning. Otherwise, which is the case that is not always the case, intro introduce uh, more refined imitation modalities. Very cool new work. Um, the causal imitation learning. Now, just a cheat sheet here. Um, if you're taking the exam, I want you one page, I wanted to see one page, the tasks that whatever, if you take, uh, uh, what is kind of the take uh, home message uh, for each of these tasks when we are trying to connect the model M of the environment, the L1, L2, L3, the policy, and so on. Um, let me read one by one. General, generalizable policy learning, learning, combining L1 and L2 interactions online and offline uh, interactions to learn a policy pie. Number two, when and where to intervene. Identify the subset of L2 and optimize the policy space based on that. This is the whole promise kind of business. Um, number three, counterfactual decision making. Optimization function ba should be based on the L3 counterfactual and randomization, not L2. Uh, um, helping here about the human AI collaboration, for example, as application. Number four, generalizability and robustness, um, generalizing from the training environment that is a SMM to a target environment M star. Um, that we have M is the uh, California desert, M star is uh, Mars. Number five, learning the causal model, combining the capabilities L1 and L2 interactions uh, to learn a G of this underlying M. Uh, number C, causal imitation learning, learn L2 policy based on the partially observable L1 data that is coming from the expert, given that you don't have access to the reward that this expert is getting. Um, I would say that this is the CRL dimensions that I can envision, haven't seen uh, contemplated, and I think uh, 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 it's, it's very cool, um, obviously. Um, uh, now let me um, conclude. Causal inference and reinforcement learning are fundamentally intertwined, and novel learning opportunities emerge when this connection is fully realized. Uh, the structural invariances encoded in the causal graph with respect to the underlying SCM can be leveraged and combined with our allocation procedures, leading to robust and efficient learning. Still, uh, if you want to win by, there's winning by love and winning by hate. This is like, or this fear. Uh, if you read the Torah or the Talmud, I'd say. But uh, still, um, failure to acknowledge the distinct invariance of the environment, that is the M, all, almost always leads to the poor decision making. Um, CRL opens up a new family of learning problems 
that were neither acknowledged nor understood before, including the combination of online and offline learning, the GPL, when and where to intervene, counterfactual decision making, generalizability across environments, causal imitation learning, and so on. <clears throat> the program here, the agenda that I have been pursuing, and I would like you to help and to pursue as well as, as you can, is the, the we'd like to develop a principle, not hack, a principle framework for designing causal AI systems that are integrated in these three, observational, experimental, and counterfactual, both data, modes of reasoning, and knowledge. Everything here is not metaphorical. There's a counterpart in the language, in the in the in the formal language, and this uh, I believe that leads to a very general, most natural treatment to human-like explainability and rational decision making. Um, his sources here, both the, the the slides, the the papers also, and the survey coming soon. Uh, maybe whenever you see this or watch this, will be there. Uh, point your browser to the crl.causeai.net. Uh, thank you. And um, also, if you have any question here, I'll be happy. Sorry for going a little bit over time, maybe 10 minutes more or 15. Uh, but thank you for your presence, for being patient and nice with me. And uh, I'll be glad to take questions and talk more. <clears throat>